third world socialism uh, covers a lot of countries, and I'm going to concentrate on very specific um, list of these. But the first thing to say about the countries that claim to be in this category is that the coming to power of these states was mainly through military coups or um, political machinations within the ruling circles. So you can't um, uh, say that there was a party involved of any kind, even of the vanguard kind or a non-communist party kind. There weren't necessarily, very often there weren't any um, protests, revolutions, and so on. And we have to emphasize that they're mainly products of a certain era. They rely, at least in the 20th century, the middle of the 20th century and towards 1960s, maybe 70s, on diplomatic relations, recognition, and trade with USSR. Um, I suppose you can find parallels in the 21st century in the, in the way China is dealing with some developing economies, as they are now called, as opposed to third world. But China is much more agnostic about the characteristics of uh, developing countries it has relations with. Um, USSR did, but at the same time had this special category of third world socialist allies, so to speak. Some at times uh, referred to as non-aligned in that they um, in the UN and various other places, they didn't at least take the side of the uh, U U United States. China, as I said, is far more agnostic. Note its uh, closest ally in the Middle East is Saudi Arabia, and I think that should tell you a lot about where the current Chinese political leadership is when it comes to issues like that. Um, as a political concept, the whole title Third Worldism was used in the late 1940s, early 1950s, during the Cold War. And um, as I said, there are um, synonyms with non-aligned, but not always. As a general rule in these countries, uprisings and revolutions were fought and uh, very often one, not to build socialism, but to dispose of a particular despot, at times a despot that remained um, closely associated or at least had the reputation of being associated with the former colonial power. As such, they can't be called class revolutions. In many, if not all cases, the success was only made possible by class alliances. And in most cases, the talk of socialism only came later after the event had finished, after the generals, the officers, the political bureaucrats had come to power, almost as a byproduct of events. Um, and it was more of a propaganda. So, uh, let me emphasize again, we are not here talking of vanguard parties. We are not obviously talking of informed, unified, committed alliances of, of, of workers. Um, and therefore, the understanding of the term socialism is quite loose. It's, um, if you like, uh, they have their own definitions. I will talk about African socialism and Arab socialism. Uh, but in general, um, it's a very populist concept uh, of taking measures often with authoritarian tactics and at times a combination of populism authoritarianism. In, I think, all cases, but let's say in most cases, these countries subsequently evolved to become capitalist dictatorships and with the collapse of the Soviet Union to cut a very long story short, they did join uh, the new economic order. They were part, they are uh, all part of the global economy of um, neoliberal economic policies. In 
this uh, move towards dictatorship and, and complete capitalist um, um, authoritarianism uh, can maybe understood for those of you who remember Jamal Abdel Nasser, well, Sadat was his vice president, Mubarak was Anwar Sadat's nominee. So you can see how Jamal Abdel Nasser ends in Mubarak. And of course, now in Sisi, but that's a different story. Um, the, this period of the 20th century is the period of the development of the means of production uh, in these countries globally means of production are developing. There is a movement of peoples across the third world from agriculture into industry. And um, at times, because industry is not really available, ready to employ the, this uh, inflow, uh, we see uh, the uh, precarious mode of informal, vulnerable employment for this uh, type of people. Um, just to um, remind you what we are talking about, uh, during this period, third world rates of urbanization exceeds those that existed in the heydays of the Anglo-European Industrial Revolution. Of course, this whole change, this development, uh, increased the desire amongst um, the educated, the middle classes, the technocrats for very rapid development. Catching up with the, with the West was very much the um, ambition and the, uh, if you like, the, the declared aim of many such people. If you read uh, what um, Middle Eastern uh, technocrats were writing at the time. Uh, there is this envy of the political and economic development in the West and the desire to copy it and to become um, uh, like the West, if you like, or more developed, more industrialized. Uh, the countryside is looked at with disdain. And in, in this, the US, of course, had its own policies. If you look at uh, many of the third world, the US had plans. It uh, got involved in, um, in with various despots, various semi-despots, to run its own program of development. But very often, the corruption of the uh, former the, of the kings, the despots, and so on, made such paths even slower than what was expected, and there was impatience in the in if you like in a generation in that period. Of course, post-colonial era is also the uh, the time when we see the rise of nationalism, all forms of anti-colonial, anti-imperialist tendencies. And again, this is not just amongst the working class, the educated middle classes, the army officers, the technocrats are as much in this anti-colonial movement. And usually these categories that I mentioned are the people who lead military coups. Um, they might be small popular movements in some of the cities, some of the capitals, there are popular movements that support the coming to power of um, a coup or a, a, or a, a, techno, a group of technocrats deciding on this regime change. But we can't really talk of revolution. I'm not saying there weren't, they weren't popular, but there weren't revolutions. And of course, um, all this is possible because the USSR is in the background supporting such movements. And I will talk right at the end about the Soviet theory about third world socialism and the practice, because they are completely uh, opposite of each other. The uh, common characteristics that these countries define uh, as their, um, if you like, as what is socialism is um, um, abolition of private property. They talk about it, but it's often what they mean is limitation of private property of the ancien regime. 
not abolition of private property. Nationalization of sections of industry, and in some cases, uh, nationalizations of sectors of agriculture. There are occasionally failed attempts at collectivization of agriculture, but we don't see a lot of that. And uh, the main, one of the main factors is the control of distribution of goods and services. And that is important because it increases the power of the central state and those uh, who have led the, led the regime check. The, they also um, establish a, a planning bureaucracy and uh, they have uh, often a, a, a state system based on one party and the uniform ideology. So if you have Arab socialism, it's a very uniform ideology. You can't um, um, distract from it. You can't move away from it. And of course, with all of this, inevitably, uh, there is the idea of setting up elaborate security services for controlling the population and dealing with any potential opposition. Um, and although most of these steps are originally described as steps necessary to deal with the previous order, very often they are repressive measures against uh, workers and against um, communists, against leftists. Um, in some of the terms that are used, such as nationalization, it's actually the outcome is not very important. So they're mainly seen as slogans. So the slogan of nationalization uh, has a lot more weight than what actually is planned to do. Um, and of course, the uh, levels of these nationalizations differ from country to country, depends on whether we are talking of um, single product countries, oil producers, or we are talking of a more diverse economy, such as Egypt, where nationalization is more difficult and doesn't take the same, the same line. Uh, no one um, really understands how this will work in practice, and there isn't much attention to detail. It's, as I said, a publicity stunt. I want to spend a bit of time about uh, speaking about the different kinds of the third world nationalism because they have different characteristics. I uh, don't think when you when people talk of third world socialism, they talk put them all in one basket, but they are different. So we have, uh, for example, African socialism. It's a socialism adopted by several African leaders, it's mainly related to the end of French and British colonial rule in the 1950s. Um, as these countries gain independence, um, anti-colonial nationalism can no longer be the unifying force that it had been in the earlier periods from the Second World War to the early 1950s. African socialism becomes a mobilizing slogan uh, to unite Africans around the challenges of economic development. And as I said, in Africa, as in the Middle East, as in the rest of the third world, this um, aim for economic development is very uh, prevalent. The communal basis of most African pre-colonial societies and the absence of a tradition of private property in some ways justifies the existence of what these uh, the founders of this movement called the African path to socialism. Um, and at times, they presented, as the uh, Arab socialists did later, as a third way. This is the third way that is not capitalism, it's not communism, it's actually ethnically closer to the peoples of the region. So there isn't a well-established um, theory for this, so don't look for historical books that explain this, but it's um, it 
very uh, rapidly grows and it has a very populist approach. So we have proponents such as Leopold Senghor um, and Madame Dia in Senegal, Sekuture in Guinea, um, Nakromo in Ghana, um, Amoya in Kenya, Nereri in Tanzania. And they all um, um, basically talk of these African approaches to socialism. Um, in 1962, they even ho hold a conference in Dhaka to discuss how they would describe this. And I don't think that there isn't, a, I haven't found a well-defined sentence, expression of what this means. Um, as a result, you have these varieties of different interpretations of what is African socialism, and they all reflect the country where the, the uh, proponents of this particular brand of socialism are talking about. And here, the word socialism I'm using very much in quotes. It's not what I would call socialism. So um, they all um, have something in common in that they look at pre-colonial communal values of Africa, and some of them do talk about the fact that the, the absence of classes in the pre-colonial era. So they are not, uh, if you like, completely ignorant of what is going on. But the themes they emphasize are African identity, um, economic development, social control, and class formation, because in some ways there is this absence maybe of classes. Senghor is probably one of the first to use the term African socialism. Uh, and um, he talks of the pre-colonial collective traditions of the continent. Uh, he talks about uh, the celebration of black culture, um, the African personality. I'm quite familiar with this because regularly I receive articles for critiques that um, debate various aspects of African socialism. And most of them can't be published in critique because they don't have anything to do with socialism. But that's a different story. Um, Dia uh, talks of a humanist outlook and um, uh, presents African socialism as something that could unite Christian and Muslim beliefs. Um, different Pan-Africans such as Padmore uh, talk of threefold revolutionary movement that will involve self-determination, social revolution, and continental unity. And none of these are on themselves bad. It's just the way they are going about it um, is very much uh, nationalist and at times um, uh, uh, anti-socialist in real terms. So, uh, um, there are positive aspects, however, to African socialism. For example, they talk of uh, communal land uh, ownership, cooperative agriculture. Um, but then when it comes to the economy, they are very much talking of a mixed economy, initiatives between state and private capital. And here you can imagine that in a developing country where um, wealth is changing very quickly and uh, national income GDP is changing rapidly. Um, the private capital is uh, not cooperating with uh, state capital. It is uh, a predator. It wants to gain all the benefits. Um, so um, we see um, a level of um, the different routes taken by all of these. So uh, 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 Nkrumah uh, stresses large-scale uh, large development of energy resources. He wants rapid industrialization and 
Ghana uh, quickly becomes heavily indebted and uh, Kuruma became increasingly intolerant of any criticism because as the country was indebted, poverty increased, opposition increased, and he became intolerant of cr criticism. So in 1964, he declared himself uh, president for life um, and banned opposition parties until he was overthrown in 1966. But that's, if you like, the end of uh, uh, this particular experiment of uh, African socialism in Ghana. Guinea became independent in more turbulent, uh, uh, after a more turbulent event. It accepted uh, eventually France's offer of independence in 1958, and the entire French colonial apparatus, civil service, moved out of the country. So, um, uh, Guinea's African socialism uh, was basically trying to uh, develop state-run mechanized farms and market controls. But Guinea lacked the personnel for this. And um, uh, at the time when independence happened, not the fault of Guinea, but the fault of the colonial power, the entire country had 50 university graduates. The um, uh, poverty, which was the legacy of colonial policy, was overwhelming. Uh, the state farms founded and price control alienated the peasants, who um, basically were became part of the uh, smuggled rings into neighboring countries to obtain higher price for their good. Again, social discontent mounted and the rule of the leadership became increasingly centralized and authoritarian. Toure, who was one of the leaders, remained in power until his death in 1984, but it is one of the most authoritarian, uh, brutal dictatorships. Uh, Nieri, um, who is uh, best known as a, I think, East African advocate, he was in favor of village level uh, development. Um, but again, he um, followed the ideas that a one party state uh, was the way forward. And in addition, he argued that class divisions had nothing to do with Africa, that um, um, social differences <laughs> could be reconciled within a single party. Um, and indeed, uh, soon these people um, uh, were told that capitalism could respond to what, is, what the country needed. Um, in Tanzania, in Zanzibar, um, uh, the lead uh, uh, in Tanzania, which was uh, the union of Tanganyika and Zanzibar, Nyerere promoted the idea of Uyama, uh, is, I believe it's Swahili for familyhood, someone else will know probably better. Um, and um, this was the idea that uh, the extended families that was the building block of African development. In 1967, he stressed um, uh, Uyama as self-reliance and austerity as the main uh, foundations of African socialism. And he launched a program of villagization, uh, the forced relocation of rural people into cooperatives and collective villages, which was going to be the basis of new development. But the initiative was very unpopular. Economically, it was completely non-viable. And again, um, the peasants resisted um, um, and uh, the state resorted to repression. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, the uh, uh, Nereri uh, 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 imprisoned his opponents and um, despite that, some of these remained very much um, 
in favor of uh, African socialism, but uh, the plight of African socialism was basically um, uh, dealt by um, early 60s, the late 60s, early 70s, but even earlier in some cases. Arab socialism, again, has its roots in the uh, opposition to colonialization in the Middle East, uh, which was coupled with um, uh, high levels of corruption. Very little has changed there. Under development, which was again characteristic of Arab societies. Um, it was in the late 1940s that Arab thinkers began writing about socialist options. And uh, I'm here I mean this kind of socialist options, not communist, because obviously uh, uh, Egypt had communists in the 1920s, um, many other Arab countries did. Among the major uh, groups that supported this idea of Arab uh, socialism were the what are, what were called the Arab Renaissance socialist parties, Al-Bas. You will remember Saddam Hussein of Al-Bas. And um, the movement uh, in Egypt, uh, because it started in Egypt, called the Free Offices, was led by Jamal Abdel Nasser. The aim of Arab socialists were to free the Arab world from the Western colonial rule, to establish what they called pride in their own countries and social justice, and even at its initial stages, the unity of the Arab world was mentioned. Arab socialism came into existence at a time when liberation movements were uh, right across developing countries. So self-determination and tight controls against multinational corporations and their exploitation of local resources was quite a priority. But Arab socialism rejected Marxism and class struggle as um, any uh, basic idea. It promoted the cooperation between classes for the welfare of the entire community. It talked of principles of justice quite vague in a way that we are quite familiar to hear in, for example, Iran's Islamic history. Republic, the equal distribution of wealth and government provisions for the poor and underprivileged. So all of it was very fluffy. There was no substance to this description of Arab socialism. Agrarian reform and land distributions were declared as goals. Nationalizations of various industries were to provide the central state with funds, and some form of uh, uh, private property was accepted, was retained, and the um, leaders, the officers, for example, in Cairo, talked that such retention of private property was in the national interest. Um, Nasser was probably following one of the most radical economic policies, amongst uh, others that I will mention, nationalization um, of British and French interests was uh, on the agenda, and he achieved some of them. In 1960, banks, newspapers, foreign assets, industrial and mining industries, and export import businesses were nationalized. Now, you have to remember that when we're talking of nationalization here, um, there is no private capital anyway. So it is a transfer of colonial or foreign owned um, industries, banks, uh, whatever, uh, by a central state, by a new state. The land reform uh, started in 1952. It had already set limits on land ownership, but in 1960, they were uh, uh, the, the limits of land ownership were cut. Um, similar nationalization policies were applied in Algeria, in Libya, and in Iraq. And in all of these, 
especially in Libya and Iraq, the whole question of control of petroleum and gas industries were essential and they were nationalized. Um, in the 1990s, Arab regimes whose economic policies had been called Arab in, in, in socialist, obviously started to liberalize or privatize sectors of uh, their economy, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union. These efforts, again, were not that successful in that the bureaucracy resisted the privatization, but at the same time wanted to benefit. So this is where we see in the Middle East all these uh, what some people called false privatization. Privatizations that basically is bought by sections of those who are in power over the bureaucracy. The positive side of Arab socialism, I suppose we should uh, talk about it, was uh, its emphasis on the struggle against what, uh, again, these are words that are used by Nasser, by Basis, and so on, but, but they are important. Now you can look back with nostalgia to some of these, but they do talk about fighting imperialism and Zionism. But most importantly, the support for the Palestinian cause was a major issue, especially for Nasser. I think uh, he and the Egyptian leaders of his uh, generation uh, um, at times used the Palestinian case to enhance their own power, but they did, at least on the international scene, defend and support the Palestinians, and they did go to war, after all, in 1967. Uh, the defeat of uh, that war, I think, marked uh, the beginning of the end of what I would call Arab nationalism. I mean, it lasted, uh, obviously, in the form of the Ba'ath parties in Syria and Iraq much longer. But um, I think after the death of Nasser in 1970, we can say that Basism had lost most of it, much of its appeal. Um, these states, uh, Nasser, Egypt, uh, uh, Basist Iraq, Basist Syria, are identified with lack of democracy, corrupt, and very large bureaucracies, huge bureaucracies. And these bureaucrats and uh, army officers, technocrats, all um, actually worked quite actively to end Arab socialism because as they gained, um, they wanted more for their, themselves, for their families, they were more in favor of privatization, um, high um, ambitions, political uh, slogans, high as in good uh, political slogans were no longer important. And um, that is how we see the uh, Nasser regime being followed by um, Sadat and then followed by Mubarak. So the, the trend is quite uh, uh, obvious. Um, there was talk of socialist, Arab socialist unity. And um, there was talk of uh, an alliance first between Egypt, Sudan, and um, Libya, and, uh, and Algeria, the Ba'ath Party in Syria, the Revolutionary Socialist Party in Somalia, um, and the um, Yemen, the Socialist Parties of Yemen. But none of it came to much. Um, and I think, um, uh, here we can see that very little was achieved by this. The fact that these states felt, um, if you like, under threat, the fact that they uh, didn't manage to gain, uh, gain any support, but at the same time lost the support of their own base, means that uh, uh, their life was quite short. There is talk about the Middle Eastern socialism, and they are told they are classified at times by some people as, as third world socialism. I don't agree with that definition. I don't think the two categories that I'm going to mention actually fit in with uh, third world socialism. 
But because other people have, there are lots of articles, references to these, I will mention them. And one is a short period, um, a short period of third world socialism uh, at the time when two days after the abolition of Reza Shah and replacement by his son, Muhammad Reza Pahlavi, um, didn't gain power, but had uh, quite a lot of, well, it was one of the biggest parties of the region. And also immediately after uh, Reza Shah was sent into exile, the establishment of two republics in Azerbaijan and Mahabad in Kurdistan, Iranian Kurdistan by Stalin. Um, I don't think any of that really fits in with third world socialism, but even if you do say that that was the case, uh, populist non-aligned nationalists uh, in, in large numbers uh, supported Mossadegh immediately after this period, and uh, Mossadegh came to power 49 to 53. And I think that uh, he wasn't, he, he didn't refer to himself as a mid third world socialist. He was more of a nationalist. There are common policies between what Mossadegh was doing and what Nasser uh, had started doing. And that was privatization of uh, national resources, oil in particular. There are those who have argued that Kemalism can be added to the list. Again, I find it, you can't say that he was populist. You can say that um, um, he had some slogans that were similar to Nasser's later, Nasser came much later, but I would really dispute that. Um, So despite the fact that um, this Arab socialism considered itself inspired by social democracy, most of these states relied on strong men or um, leaders that were strong men and one party system. And therefore it was quite clear what would happen to them. Um, and this, the emphasis, the strengths of the security forces to repress opposition of any kind was, first of all, the idea of these states themselves, but the Soviet Union would play its role as well, both as an example, but also in practical terms, in terms of training some of these security forces. Um, in terms of Latin America, the socialism in Latin America, I think is at times classified as third world socialism, but in many ways it is more advanced. It has, um, if you like, more, um, the, more, more thoughts, not theory necessarily. Um, and um, the thinkers of that, uh, especially the new left that emerged in Latin America, were going um, beyond the existing efforts of just giving slogans about economic equality. And they addressed uh, issues of, uh, that were related, were unique to Latin America, including racial and ethnic uh, equality. They did... Uh, address or at least think about indigenous rights and environmental issues. Um, so the Cuban revolution of 1959 or the Sandinistas or the workers government in Porto Alegre in 1990 are if you like more advanced uh, versions of this type of third world. They have some things in common with third world um, socialism, but they are far more advanced. And at least there are attempts, uh, be it in the form of uh, vanguard parties or vanguard uh, leadership, there are attempts at uh, getting the, or guerrilla um, uh, in the case of uh, Cuba, there are attempts to get support from the workers, the peasants, and uh, a, a larger mass movement in this respect. Um, with the collapse of the 
Soviet Union, uh, most of these countries, uh, sorry, I need to switch this. Was on my second. Um, uh, most of these countries um, basically um, adopted the neoliberal economic policies. They became part of what is called the Washington Consensus. However, the US, I don't think, forgave any of them. And um, in some ways, uh, there was a mistrust of these countries, especially in the Arab, uh, what, what I refer to as the Arab socialist countries, um, Iraq, Syria, Libya, amongst them. Um, in terms of Cuba, of course, that wasn't the case. Cuba remained outside the dominance of, the, of Washington, but of course, sanctions was the answer for Cuba. Um, I want to speak at, towards the end about the USSR's attitudes to uh, this third world socialism. Because as I said earlier, they wouldn't have survived without uh, the USSR's um, political support, but also, um, I think, at very often, um, justification and ideological prettification of this type of socialism by USSR. Now, in theory, um, the Soviet writers were quite uh, negative um, about uh, some of these, but in practice, that was different. So the contradictions can be seen. For example, if you look at Yuri Ranan's uh, articles, um, some of them are referred to in critique in uh, Third World in Soviet Perspective, which appeared in 1965 under the title Problems of Communism, um, or, or the transcript of the Moscow Conference on Development, which appeared uh, uh, in 64, you will realize that um, Soviet attitudes towards what I would call Africanists, um, uh, sorry, Soviet attitudes of sp Africanist specialists towards socialism in Africa varies considerably. So some uh, talk, uh, uh, the, the question is posed, does socialism exist in Africa? Even Potikin, who became one of the leading Soviet authorities on this subject during the Khrushchev area, argues that there is no such a thing as African socialism. However, uh, he maintains that there may be an African road to socialism. And by this, he means that Africa cannot create a unique brand of socialism, one that is specific to Africa, but um, as, as it was pro uh, proclaimed by many African leaders, but uh, there may be struggles that can use some of these ideas towards um, uh, building the road to socialism. Soviet writers um, um, are of the opinion from these documents that we have seen that African readers don't understand socialism properly, which is probably true, because however, the, the reason they put for this is interesting, but I'm not sure it's correct. They say they don't live in advanced industrial countries and are isolated from the rest of the world. Um, I find it difficult because obviously by this time in the middle of the 20th century, communication has advanced, people know of the world better than that, but maybe there is some truth. Anyway, we can debate this. Um, um, and we can see, for example, that all sorts of different bourgeois ideas are uh, discussed, exposed in the African society. Another argument put forward is that um, African intellectuals have an eclectic uh, um, thinking and um, petty bourgeois ideas dominates this eclectic view. And again, um, uh, Soviet uh, analyst believes that many African leaders proclaim their belief in some variety of socialism, but actually 
use socialist slogans only to deceive the people. Um, and their understanding of um, socialism is obviously not approved by uh, Africanist in the Soviet uh, political circles. Um, however, Africa is very important for the Soviet Union. It is a major battleground. They recognize the attractions of nationalism, but also they see it as a complication. So here in practice, uh, despite all the criticisms that I uh, listed by Africanists, there is a far more um, uh, a, a positive attitude towards African socialism. Um, and the most important issue here is that if a country adopts such policies, they move away from the US and the West, and that is in itself welcome. And this is where ideological uh, justifications then come into effect, such as non-capitalist road uh, to development, a concept that gained a lot of support amongst third world technocrats and politicians, not just in Africa, but throughout the third world. Uh, for Soviet um, observers, um, the main issue uh, is that the foreign policy of these countries gives them credibility. Um, and in practice, despite all the criticisms that the specialists have said, Soviet authorities actually praise um, some of the policies in Guinea, in Mali. Uh, they uh, see, for example, the communal system of land ownership in Guinea as a precondition for taking the non-capitalist path. So um, I didn't realize you, did, you needed preconditions for non-capitalist development, but they are. Um, in terms of Arab nationalism, um, again, we see a dual approach. So and not, uh, long before Nasser came to power, Stalin's right-hand man in the uh, People's Commissariat for Nationalities, a, a guy called Mir Said Sultan Galiev, who obviously had Middle Eastern connections, editor of the journal Life of Nationalities, wrote on the subject of Islam, communism, and what is known today as the third world. Galiev uh, uh, was of the opinion that the only way this was to be accomplished, the national liberation of these countries can only be a, accomplished through a socialist revolution, but without a class war. And that's a very, I find this a very strange definition because it's, hard to see how you could have uh, a fight for socialism. Uh, I suppose this is the peaceful road to socialism. And here you can see that uh, the coup by Nasser, it fits in. You, have a, you don't have class uh, uh, struggles, you don't have class war. Uh, suddenly someone comes to power and he's declared himself to be a socialist. Um, Galiev has very strange opinions. He also says that since almost all classes in Muslim society have been oppressed by colonialists, they're all entitled to be called proletarian. And um, he adds on that Islam should not be destroyed, but religious fanatism has to be you know, controlled, done away with. Um, and here we see that this combination of these third world socialists form part of the, uh, become quite close allies of USSR. The USSR uh, invites them to uh, what are called the conferences of communist and workers parties. And they are the, the supporters of the thesis, the non-capitalist road to development. 
national democratic uh, revolutions where a state sector of industry is being established and where dictatorial and despotic methods of government have been rejected. But the truth is that the dictatorial and despotic methods of government haven't been destroyed. They are replaced by a new leadership, which is not socialist and has no uh, concept of socialism or democracy or you know, class struggles. Um, so in general, uh, they uh, consider the fact that in most of these countries, the, as far as the Soviet Union is concerned, they come to the opinion that the proletariat has not yet developed to a force that can lead social development. And uh, the urban classes, the peasantry, the democratic intelligentsia, who are important in the struggle for national independence or independence from colonial power, um, have to assume an active role, and they are supported by this. Now, um, you can imagine that following such a scenario, at the end of the day, we are facing a situation where very few of these remain in power. The dictatorships that followed in the Ba'ath Party with the concentration of power from one ruler to another, the coup d'etats in Iraq that led to uh, successive dictators become, gaining power led to co the coming to power of Saddam Hussein. I've already talked about Nasser, the, the trajectory from Nasser. In one of the few places where there has been a uh, if you like a continuity, be it uh, a continuity not of Arab socialism, but of Arab socialism uh, becoming very much Arab capitalism. And yet the same family seems to be still in power in Syria, where Hafez al-Assad was the, the father of Bashar Assad, was the, uh, the, the defender of Arab socialism and his son, is still in power, be it after a lot of war. So in general, the history of Arab, uh, of Middle Eastern socialism, Arab socialism, African socialism has been pretty bad. One of the problems with the Soviet acceptance of these countries is that very often it coincided with um, these states uh, suppressing larger numbers of communists. So at times not many, but at times large numbers. But there is also the case that in some of these countries, um, if like the FLN in Algeria or the Arab Socialist Union in Egypt, there are also periods where, um, because of the Soviet alliance, uh, communists are released from prison. So I'm not trying to draw a complete, if you like, dark scenario from that period. But the reality is that um, communist socialists, true genuine socialists, are the victims of this alliance for two reasons. One, this metamorphosis from Arab socialism to Arab despotic reactionary capitalism has made people disillusioned with any so socialist idea, with communism, with socialism. And as a result of this, we see the emergence of religious movements. I don't think we can just blame the Salafis for, for this. I think we have to look at the historical backgrounds that has led these defeats, these um, the dangers that these governments posed, but also the fact that this type of socialism very often took uh, amongst its first victims, uh, the revolutionary, the genuine revolutionary forces, communist Marxists. And as a result, it allowed, it left a vacuum that was filled by jihadis, Salafis, and so on. So the, the, this period should be seen as another era which played an important role in the third world, in what is now called the developing world in terms of weakening socialism, in terms of creating disillusionment with left-wing ideas, 
but also in terms of uh, practical repression of genuine revolutionary forces. Thank you. I appreciate it.